Go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for showing up uh, for an evening session. I promise you it's going to be a good one. Uh, it's going to get pretty specific, um, but also pretty strategic, so both, both tactical and strategic. Um, by way of introduction, my name's Rachel Locke. I'm the director of an initiative called Impact Peace at the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego. And I am very happy to have on stage with me Thomas Apt, who's a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy of School, School of Government, uh, who previously served as a policymaker in the Obama administration in the Justice Department and um, in the New York State Governor's Office, overseeing all criminal justice and homeland security agencies. We also have Angela May from um, the UN Office on Drug and Crimes. She's the chief of research of sorry, Chief of Research and Trend Analysis for UNODC, and has also overseen the recent um, 2019 homicide report released by UNODC, which I would share a copy of to show you, but I think Thomas actually stole all of the hard copies that she had earlier today. Um, but it's great, it's, it's filled with lots of facts and data. Um, so the way that, so I should also say before we start that this event is being live streamed so um, if and when you ask questions, and we will have time for Q&A, just be aware that there is live streaming of this event taking place. Um, so we're here to talk about violence that takes place in cities, uh, the plight of urban violence. And we'll be focusing the first part of the discussion on Thomas's recent book, which I have a copy of right here. It's called Bleeding Out. You can't have this copy. It's mine. I paid for it. But um, it's easily purchasable on, online, I believe, or probably in bookstores here. I'm not sure of that. This book primarily concerns violence that's taking place in the United States, um, both kind of the diagnosis of serious violence in the US and also practical solutions for how to address that violence. Um, so for the first 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to be talking a lot about the United States of America and the context of violence and lessons and evidence of what's worked there. We're then going to shift for the last um, 20 to 30 minutes to talk a little bit about the international context, so non-violence that takes place outside of the US, um, and whether some of the lessons from US analysis, diagnosis, and responses are relevant to other contexts? If so, what? How can we think about adapting them? Um, and so we're very happy to have An Angela for that portion of the discussion. And then we'll have quite a bit of time for Q&A. So start jotting down your questions. Um, we, we set aside quite a bit of time. We want to have this really be open and discussion oriented. So we encourage that. So I want to start, Thomas, by asking you to give, for those of us in the audience who are perhaps less familiar, to give a little bit of context of what violence in the US looks like today. Um, is it, a lot of people think of the US and they think it's a very high violent society. Um, they see a lot of images through media, et cetera, and think our cities are sort of blighted by extremely high levels of violence. Give us a picture of what violence looks like and um, in particular, sort of who is bearing the burden of violence in the US? Uh, sure, so um, in a discussion about violence, let's focus on um, homicide because it's simultaneously the most serious and best measured uh, form of violence that we have. Um, you know, in the United States, we have a, 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 a homicide rate that's about seven times higher than high-income nations, and that's driven by a gun homicide rate that's about 25 times higher than other high-income nations. And we'll talk about the role of, of firearms and guns a little bit later, I believe. Uh, how you view that uh, violence over time really uh, depends on your baseline. Uh, if you look back 25 years, uh, the, uh, using a baseline of, say, the early 90s, um, there's been massive progress in the United States. Um, violent, uh, uh, violent crime has dropped about 50% uh, during that time period. Uh, but if you go back another 25 years, uh, we have a homicide rate that is about the same as it is today. So that's 50 years with no progress whatsoever. 
if you want to disaggregate uh, the, uh, these homicide rates and talk about different forms of uh, homicide, um, about uh, less than 5%, probably about 3% of uh, all homicides in the United States are mass killings. Um, and despite this small number, they drive an enormous amount of the conversation, the public conversation in the United States. Um, a slightly uh, larger but still small percentage of all homicides are police killings, killings by the police. Um, that's probably less than 10% of, uh, of all deaths. Um, and that's actually not included in the official homicide counts of the United States, but it's still important to reference. Then about 20% uh, of all homicides in the United States are uh, related to family violence or intimate part partner violence. And then finally, uh, you have uh, urban violence, which accounts for uh, the largest single component uh, of, of uh, all homicides, and that's probably well over 50%, um, and you know maybe 80 to 90% of the remainder of all of those other ones. Um, and that urban violence is the subject of, of my book and our conversation here today. And what I mean by urban violence is really the intersection um, of a number of related terms. Uh, it's sort of the connection between gang violence, gun violence, street violence, community violence, the, the sort of the nexus of all of these things. And what it really is talking about is uh, violence uh, that is uh, perpetrated largely in cities, but not exclusively in cities, uh, between and among uh, typically uh, poor people of color. And in reference to your question specifically, who are the victims of this form of violence? Uh, the number one victim of violent crime in the United States is uh, young men of color. And in fact, uh, if you look at the leading causes of death, uh, according to the CDC, uh, homicide is the third leading cause of death for young white men. It's the second leading cause of death for young Latino men. Um, and it's the first leading cause of death for young African American men. And among young African American men, it accounts for more deaths than the nine other top 10 causes combined. So it is a, a massive disparity. I, I have known that um, statistic for a long time, and I still find it abhorrent and shocking that the number one cause of death is homicide. Um, in your book, you speak a lot about the public health approach to, um, to violence. And I think uh, probably a lot of people in this room are familiar with some of the conversations around treating violence as um, a, something that transmits, as a disease transmits from people and, and from groups. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about um, what, how you frame the public health conversation in your book, and in particular, sort of what are the benefits of the framing, and also what are the challenges inherent in that framing? Sure, so uh, I believe deeply in the public health uh, approach, but it does have limitations. Um, in the book, uh, which, you know, uh, which is referenced in the title, I I'm basically making an argument that we should treat urban violence in the United States as we treat a gunshot wound uh, in the emergency room, in that we should address it uh, immediately and directly. Um, and I use that public health metaphor instead of perhaps the better known metaphor of treating violence as a disease. And the reason for that is while I think uh, there are many aspects of, uh, of violence that do operate like a disease, I think it loses some of the immediacy and urgency of the problem. Um, some diseases are acute conditions that are life-threatening and demand immediate action, but many are not. Uh, and I think that uh, that's, uh, that's one of the, my uh, issues with the metaphor. And I think that actually translates to uh, a, a, a statement about the public health approach uh, more broadly. In theory, um, there is nothing about the public he health, health approach that preferences um, you know, broad-based solutions over more targeted, immediate solutions. But in practice, uh, in, among public health practitioners, there is an em emphasis on broad-based primary prevention as opposed to more targeted uh, 
secondary or tertiary prevention. And that's not consistent with the majority of evidence in either public health or criminology that suggests that actually the most targeted and the most focused strategies are most effective. And so while I believe in the public health approach, I think we need to be careful about um, uh, approaching uh, the issue uh, in a broad, abstract way in terms of risk factors or even root causes. Um, you know, the conventional wisdom about violence is that it is an intractable problem that is simply a function of inequality, poverty, structural racism, all of these broad-based factors. And there's two challenges with that framework. The first is, as a matter of sort of concrete and feasible policies, there's very little we can do in the short or middle term to address employment generally, or to address education generally, or inequality, or all of these other issues. That's just a, a massive political obstacle. The second uh, obstacle is empirical, which is that the relationship between these root causes um, and violence is actually less clear uh, uh, than one might think. There is a strong association between, let's say, poverty and violence, meaning that if you have a static comparison, rich countries tend to be less violent than poor countries, same for communities, same for individuals. But when you look at that comparison over time and make it not static but dynamic and look for a causal connection, an if-then connection, then that relationship becomes a lot muddier. In, per, in particular, if you look at Latin America, Latin America has gotten increasingly more violent as it has also gotten wealthier. In the United States, violent crime declined during the Great Depression, rose during the booming 60s, and then slightly declined or held constant during the Great Recession. So it's important to understand that that, that relationship is not as clear as one might think. And in fact, that relationship between root causes and violence might even be stronger in reverse. And what I mean by that is that urban violence, there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that urban violence is perpetuating inequality, concentrated poverty. It's making it harder to educate children. It's making it harder to uh, provide adequate housing. It's making it harder to promote good physical, mental, and emotional health. And so I think that we need to look at these relationships, but we need to look at them in both directions. Um, so I, I think that one of the one of the issues that many people in the sort of public health community would say is that um, it's been an exceptionally important framing for the purpose of demonstrating that violence is preventable, right? That there's something that we can do about it, just picking up on something that you said, which is many people see violence as something that's inevitable, a part of the human condition, and that we can respond to it, but we can't actually prevent it. And so there has been uh, quite a bit of energy that's come from a shift in that narrative in part from the public health community, but also in part, I think, from advances in criminology and law enforcement, um, and also advances in science and evidence and knowledge about what works to prevent violence. Um, so in your book, you talk about sort of three key pin principles. Um, these are focus, balance, and fairness. And I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about each of, each of those for folks who haven't already read the book. Sure. What, is, what do each of these principles mean? How did you come to them? And then how do you make them, what, what do they look like in practice? Operationalize them a little bit. Sure. So those principles really came from a systematic meta review that myself and a colleague of mine from Harvard, Christopher Winship, performed in 2016. And what we were doing was we were trying to wrap our arms around uh, all of the, uh, in a very systematic way, all of the most rigorous evidence concerning uh, inter interventions to reduce uh, community or urban violence. And so what that meant was uh, trying to find a way to aggregate all of the impact evaluations that were either quasi-experimental or experimental for the wonks in the audience. Uh, the higher, the more rigorous evidence that really you could draw causal inferences from and not just um, uh, associations from. And to wrap our arms around that in a systematic way. And ultimately, by doing this systematic review, meta-review, which is a review of reviews, 
we were able to synthesize over 1,400 individual impact evaluations. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to know whether there were elements of effectiveness that were associated with uh, successful strategies, meaning like what, what did these, the most successful strategies have in common? And it turned out that they had a number of things in common. And in that report, I sort of summarized those in more technical terms, but in the book, I summarized them in these three sort of what I called fundamentals of violence reduction. And the first was focus. If you wanna be successful in reducing violence, you have to be, uh, not all violence, urban violence. Again, we're always focused here for this discussion on urban violence. You have to be focused because urban violence is uh, sticky, meaning that it is not evenly distrib distributed. It concentrates and clusters among a surprisingly small number of people, places, and behaviors. So, you know, in a, for, so for instance, in a allegedly dangerous neighborhood, uh, violence, is not in, uh, violence is not evenly distributed. In fact, the vast majority of people in most quote unquote dangerous neighborhoods are in fact not dangerous. It's a very small minority of people, even in those communities, who perpetrate that violence. And uh, within those communities, there are certain uh, areas known as hotspots, which are basically micro locations that are generating the vast majority of violence. And if you're from a poor community, uh, you know this because you know your mother told you walk up this street and not this street, and you know hang out with this person, not this person. And it's important not to stigmatize uh, entire communities or classes of people with this broad brush of dangerousness or violence. Um, you know, and this, this theme of concentration, which is certainly true in cities th in the United States, uh, we have evidence is actually true in many cities outside of the United States as well. Less than 1% of uh, your population is going to generate 50, 60, 70% of your shootings and killings, and less than about 5% of your city's geography, meaning about 5% of your city blocks are gonna generate, again, the vast majority of your crime and violence. And so there is enormous efficiencies uh, if you can identify those people and places and then focus your efforts. So that's the principle of focus. The second principle is the principle of balance, which is uh, really in some ways a common sense recognition that uh, like children, like adults, uh, you know, criminals and particularly violent criminals respond to a range of incentives, both positive and negative. And usually when we think about uh, deviance or criminality, we think about punishments. But in fact, uh, rewards and, and positive incentives are important to change behavior as well. And so one of the things that was interesting when Chris and I looked across this wide range of evidence is that um, the, the evidence on a whole did not preference punishment-oriented approaches or prevention or enforcement oriented or, or, or sort of support oriented approaches. There were success, examples of successful aggressive approaches and uh, examples of successful non-aggressive, very supportive approaches. And so that was interesting. And in fact, if you look at at least the cities in the United States, there's really no example of a city that has simply arrested its way out of violence. But Importantly, there's also no example of a city that has simply programmed its way out. And so you really do need to sort of make, uh, make use of the full range of uh, incentives. And then the uh, final principle was fairness. And that really came out of the moment that we're in in the United States where we are really grappling with a crisis of confidence in the criminal justice system, issues like Ferguson and mass incarceration and all of these other things. The American criminal justice system is being subjected to a level of criticism and scrutiny that is unprecedented at least in the you know, past 30, 40, 50 years, maybe, probably, maybe since the late 60s. Um, and, so, uh, and so we have to recognize that that's the moment we're in. And in fact, there's some new literature that really suggests that the the amount of legitimacy that the criminal justice system has plays a key role in its ability to control violence. And so what we're finding is that in communities where, the, uh, where holding all things equal, you know, uh, income, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, the demographics and other things, that uh, communities that view uh, the criminal justice system more favorably have lower levels of violence and vice versa. And the, fun, and the, the way sociologists describe this uh, phenomenon is something known as legal cynicism. And it's basically a fancy way of saying that when people are cynical and don't believe in the criminal justice system, they don't use it. And so what happens is when people don't believe in the system, they don't call 911, they don't uh, report uh, crime through other means, they don't serve as witnesses or jurors. But perhaps most importantly, they don't use criminal justice for one of its oldest and most traditional functions, which is conflict resolution. And so if someone beats up your cousin, you don't call 911, you call your boys. And then a, and then a, and then a beating leads to a shooting, and then a shooting leads to a killing, and so on and so forth, creating a cycle of retaliatory violence, which is something that's very common in this, in this area. Uh, and so that is, so it's extremely important that whatever we do in the name of violence reduction, that it's perceived to be legitimate by the communities uh, that are most impacted by that. And I would include in those communities the criminals themselves. That's very important. Uh, and so how does this actually operate in practice? So there's a strategy uh, in the United States that's, and it's been experimented with a bit, uh, and actually Rachel has been one of the leaders in uh, bringing this strategy abroad. Um, so I'll, I'll explain this to the audience, not to you. <laughs> not to you. Um, uh, called focused deterrence, and this uh, the system the the strategy has been uh, rigorously evaluated a number of times, and in fact, a recent systematic review noted that of 24 uh, tests of the strategy, um, on 19 of the 24 occasions, it produced significant positive results, and in particular, when it was done for gang or group related violence, it was successful 12 out of 12 times and it produced a uh, effect size of 0.657. Uh, I'll just translate th that for you. Uh, 0.657 is a very large uh, uh, um, effect size um, in, in, this, in these policy circles, and it translates to reductions in gun violence of 40, 50, even 60%, so very significant large effects. And so what is focused deterrence and why has it been successful? Um, focused deterrence uh, basically uh, is, uh, involves um, bringing a partnership together of law enforcement officials, community members, and service providers, and then uh, uh, basically confronting the individuals at the highest risk uh, individuals and groups at the highest risk for violence. Those who are people who are most likely to be shoot, to, to shoot or be shot. And then presenting a sort of unified front and communicating a very simple, clear message. And the message is, uh, we know it's you who's doing the shooting. The shooting has to stop. If you put the guns down, we will help you. And if you refuse to put the guns down, we will stop you. And so it's a promise to help and a promise to punish. And then uh, the partnership makes good and follows up on those promises. For the uh, individuals who are willing to change their lives, people off, there's uh, treatment offered, assistance and support, all kinds of uh, uh, services. For those who refuse and persist in violent behavior, uh, there are targeted enforcement actions to, uh, to bring the full force of the law. Upon those, uh, upon those individuals. And then the conversation continues um, and, and says, you know, as we've said before, here, is our, here are our promises. Please, you know, please, uh, please desist uh, to avoid these consequences. And so, this, and, and so the uh, strategy has been successful. For instance, in Oakland, uh, it was implemented in 2012. There's a recent evaluation that shows that it's reduced violence in Oakland by 50%. 50, uh, 50%. Now, why is it working? Um, I would argue that it's working because it's consistent with these three principles. First, um, it's extremely focused. Focused deterrence, just as, as it has in its name, 
focuses only on the people and groups that are most likely the highest risk individuals. In Oakland, that was less than 1% of the entire population, about 400 people in the entire city. So all of a sudden, this, this massive problem becomes much more concrete and manageable. Uh, not only does it focus on a small number of individuals, it's also focusing on one behavior. It's not an anti-crime program. It's an anti-violence program. It's saying, stop the shooting. It's not saying, stop your other criminal activities. It's saying, we're focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is the shooting and the killing. The second reason it's uh, uh, effective is because of this balance. It off, there, is a pun there is certainly a promise to punish if violent behavior continues, but it's also a promise of support and treatment and services. So there's positive and negative incentives. And finally, there is this aspect of fairness. We are coming to you, we are engaging you, we're gonna talk to you directly, and we're gonna offer you a choice. We're gonna respect your agency. And it's not just the police who are coming to you, it's the community is, that is coming to you. It's mothers, uh, one of the most powerful things in these presentations to these young men is often mothers who have lost children saying, please, you know, I don't want what happened to uh, my son to happen to you. And so it is this, and, and so it is that, that message of empathy and accountability that is perceived as legitimate. And so that's a little bit about how these strategies work in practice. So I, I think it's worth mentioning, and we can come back to this during the Q&A session if folks are interested, that Oakland has long been, Oakland, California has long been among the cities struggling with um, very high violence in the US and also really struggling with some pretty significant lack of trust between um, certain communities, particularly communities of color and the police. Um, and so I, I, I just say that that's worth mentioning because this has worked in a context of um, uh, a real breakdown in legitimacy and has been part of actually trying to rebuild that relationship and, and improve legitimacy. Um, so we can come back to that and I'm sure there's other examples of other interventions as well um, from the book. Just quickly, so a lot of people would say, why not talk front and center, particularly in the US context, about guns, about drugs, and about gangs? So why aren't those the three things that you're putting front and center? You mentioned them, right? but why not? Well, the, the reason is because the book is based on rigorous evaluation. And in terms of urban violence, the relationship between guns, gangs, and drugs is not as clear as people think. And again, um, they are a sort of a form of root causes. So you, can, you know, so you can wave your magic policy wand and say no more guns and no more gangs and no more drugs, but is that a realistic policy solution in the short or even middle term? I would argue it isn't. But it's also true that um, in terms of its impact on urban violence, many of the broad-based gun control measures that have been proposed don't have a strong body of evidence in terms of addressing uh, urban violence. And the reason for that is because urban violence is overwhelmingly perpetrated with guns that are already illegally possessed. So if passing one more law, making guns you know, even less legal in another circumstance, doesn't change the underlying phenomenon of urban violence. Um, and you know, uh, and so what we're better off doing is targeting uh, demand strategies. Um, same issue in terms of gangs. We, uh, we talk about gangs as a monolith, and we often fetishize them in our culture. But in fact, gangs in the United States are highly variable. Um, you know, some gangs are, are hyper-violent, some are not. Some gang members are extremely violent, some are not. And in fact, we don't have a lot of strong evidence about what works and what doesn't in terms of reducing gang crime or gang membership. And then finally, I would, I would note that there used to be a very strong association and connection between drugs and violence um, as in the United States, especially during sort of quote, quote unquote crack wars of the late 80s and early 90s. But in the early 90s, something changed about the composition of drug markets and increasingly urban violence has become less and less closely connected 
to, uh, to drugs. And so, for instance, there is a massive crisis in the United States with opioids that is killing uh, thousands of people a year due to uh, overdose deaths. But there is not a lot of serious violence associated with that, uh, with that deadly, deadly problem. So you do not see uh, you know, opioid dealers shooting it out on street corners uh, with nearly the same frequency that you used to about uh, crack cocaine. And so ultimately, this recognition um, led me back to sort of these principles and really thinking about urban violence as a function of high-risk people, high-risk pa uh, places, and ultimately high-risk behaviors. So instead of thinking about guns and gangs and drugs in absolutes as objects, think about them as behaviors. Think about guns, not about guns, but gun carrying. Not about gangs, but gang banging or gang conflicts. And not about drugs, but violent drug conflicts. And then tie those in to the key people and key places. And that's where you get those, uh, that uh, you can sort of reemphasize that balance, uh, that element of focus. And that's something that policymakers can really get their arms around. So what you're telling me is, I need to figure out who my key people are. You're telling me I need to figure out who my key places are in a, medi in a medium-sized city in the United States. That's gonna be a few hundred people. It's gonna be a few dozen places. And then you're saying, I need to stop a few key behaviors. I need to stop illegal gun carrying among these hot people in these hot places. I need to stop uh, you know, gang and group oriented behavior among these hot people in these hot places. Same thing with drugs. And so it's a way to recognize that for urban violence, that the name of the game is to focus on the violence itself. Don't look at it from the outside in, go right at the heart of it. And, uh, and, um, and you will be successful. So another thing that policymakers care a lot about is money. Uh, and you're pitching a pretty kind of clear, here's, here's principles of what works, here's examples. You also pitch pretty clearly, here's what it'll cost and, and here's what it'll save. So we're gonna switch in a minute to sort of talking about some of this outside of the US context. But before we do that, can you just give a flavor of some of the economic rationale behind the arguments that you lay out here? Sure, you know, I, I have been in this space for a long time and I've funded a lot of these programs. Uh, and so even though cost, uh, you know, cost information and cost effectiveness is, is hard to come by, I, I was in a better position uh, than most to understand um, how to fund these things. And uh, there's really, there's good news in this area, which is that these strategies that are uh, discussed in the book, focused deterrence, street outreach, hotspots policing, cognitive behavioral therapy, they can be implemented without um, new legislation, uh, without massive budget hikes, and even without deep institutional or systemic reforms. They can be done right now. There's a, there, there's, uh, a, a lot to be done in the, in the, in the uh, short, uh, short term. Um, I estimate that for about $30,000 per homicide um, in any given city, you can implement a set of these strategies that are collectively focused, balanced, and fair, and you can reduce homicide by about 10% uh, each year for eight years. And while that might sound modest, that ends up being over 50% over the entire uh, time, and that really uh, could be transformative. If you look at what that would uh, what that would cost in um, in Chicago, um, for a little more than ten million dollars per year in Chicago, you could put these strategies into place, and you would save over eight years about twelve hundred lives. Um, if you did the same thing nationally in the United States, focusing on the forty most violent cities in the United States. Uh, that pro program would cost about $899 million over eight years, less than $100 million per year, which in, in terms of the federal U.S. budget is a drop in the bucket. That is a tiny number and a very achievable number. Uh, it would save over 12,000 lives uh, over eight years. And so really the point of the book is like a, uh, like a wound in the ER, there are immediate responses that are both appropriate and necessary. And if we do those things, we can save a lot of lives. So that's 
I think all of the objective of most people who are, are here at Geneva Peace Week, right, is saving lives and building peace in the world. Um, and so I want to shift a little from a U.S. context to thinking about some of these lessons outside of the U.S. And um, I know that you've done work looking at violence, looking at serious violence outside the U.S. context. So I'm interested first in asking you um, what you think, what applies from um, some of what you've studied to international non-US contexts, and specifically sort of what's the role of institutions, um, because there's m huge variations, of course, in uh, institutional capacity, and I would say sort of norms and values um, with regard to addressing serious violence around the world. Sure. So. I think there's sort of a good news, bad news story in terms of the relevance of the book to uh, violence in the rest of the world. I think the good news is that urban violence, the specific subject of the book, uh, looks very similar all around the globe. Uh, you know, I've been to the favelas in Rio, um, you know, gang territory in, in El Salvador, and uh, all around the world uh, looking at this phenomenon. And the phenomenon looks the same. It is you know, uh, poor young men without a lot of hope, without a lot of opportunities, making very bad decisions. And so the good news is that many of the broad-based concepts in the book are likely to be applicable. Um, the bad news um, is that many of the most violent uh, contexts in the world are not suffering simply from uh, urban violence. And in fact, uh, urban violence uh, may be r sitting right alongside organized violence, family violence, and other forms of violence. And this book does not really speak to those things. And they deserve books of their own in, in terms of identifying the specific strategies that will address them. And then I think there's uh, some other limitations, which is that while the, while the problem of urban violence looks very similar context to context, the capacity for solutions, and you hinted at this, looks very different. And so here in the United States and here in Europe, there is a high capacity for solutions in implementing um, the evidence-informed strategies that I talk about in the book. Um, in, uh, in other contexts, uh, uh, I spend a lot of time in Latin America, that capacity is significantly lacking. And I think that this also speaks to sort of some of the li limitations of the evidence-based movement, um, in that the evidence-based movement, um, you know, really tries to make policy based on high quality evidence, causal evidence, and that ultimately is evidence that's generated by high quality impact evaluations, most, uh, most notably the randomized controlled trial. The problem is, is that you can only evaluate with RCTs small programmatic innovations. And so the, the evidence that is generated is sort of programmatic in orientation, when in fact policy is also a matter of institutions and systems. And so we have to be aware of that bias and then think that's particularly important outside the United States, where I believe that you know, some of the strategies that uh, are articulated in Bleeding Out um, can, uh, could be effective. But we have to understand that the assumption of Bleeding Out is that there are massive returns to programmatic innovation, assuming you have reasonably healthy institutions and systems. That's, that, assumption doesn't hold in many areas of, of the world. And so I think it's very important when we're talking about this um, to not just talk about programs when we're talking about other parts of the world, but also pairing it with uh, deep reforms uh, in both systems and institutions. So Angela, you've been um, wonderfully patient and hearing all of this. Then I should just say, because I think it's amazing, um, Angela and Thomas hadn't met before today, right? And we spent several hours earlier today talking about much of this. And I think I can say that there's some kindred spirits here in terms of really um, 
uh, wanting to dig into what our evidence tells us, what the data is out there, how we can do better. So watching the two of them sort of nerd out a little bit, if I may, was really actually a really cool experience. Um, so Angela, I'm interested if you could talk a little bit, and you, you're responsible for huge amounts of research looking at trends in, in crime and also in serious violence and the homicide monitor in particular globally. So some of what um, we've been talking about here in terms of concentration, but also in terms of the, the sort of principles of fairness, um, balance, and focus, does that resonate with the research that you've done? Um, does it resonate differently in different parts of the world? How do you interpret some of what you've heard here? Well, definitely, <clears throat> the issue of focus uh, is definitely a global issue. And uh, focus in terms of uh, geography. And um, it's true that uh, if uh, we map the world here of uh, homicide uh, by country, you will definitely see you know, where the hotspots are. Then, if we map it by subnational, you will see again that even within each country, as Tom was saying, uh, is very localized. If you go then in one city, then again uh, you see that it's localized. So it is really, you know, true across uh, uh, when we talk about criminal violence. And so that's definitely, it's also focused in terms of uh, the type of violence. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to say we are talking about uh, homicide. But, uh, you know, those of you, I wanted you to think, uh, maybe not those of you who knows uh, very intimately violence, uh, but those that they don't know. Do you think that uh, homicide kills more than conflict or conflict kills more than homicide? And um, I bet that we will have different uh, uh, answers. Uh, or I can ask you, does terrorism kill more than homicide? or more than conflict, or, uh, you know. And so, and just to put the things in the, in the perspective, in terms also of, uh, and uh, why do we talk about uh, uh, focus? Because I think, as Tom said, it's important that we understand where is the violence, who are the actors to prevent it. And so, in terms, just to give you an answer, homicide kills much more than conflict. Uh, maybe just 80 to 20, more or less. So it depends what year and uh, um, and terrorism, much less than conflict and much less uh, than homicide. Uh, but we tend, uh, but think, for example, how much at international level the efforts are to prevent uh, conflict. And then even if we zoom into the homicide, just again, roughly, because these numbers, uh, you can imagine the quality of the data when we go outside the US and Europe, but roughly, uh, the number of people that are killed in conflict uh, are about the same uh, as the number of people that are killed uh, on or in organized crime. And, uh, and again, think about uh, the international community um, resources, attention, uh, focus uh, on preventing conflict, how much less is on organized crime. And uh, think about uh, how much, and you are researchers, how much research uh, there is uh, on uh, preventing conflict uh, and, uh, you know, conflict resolution, etc. There is very little, we were discussing this afternoon, uh, to really understand uh, how do we prevent organized crime. And once we have organized crime very violent, how do we stop it? Um, so, definitely, that in terms of uh, focus. But um, compared to the, what the, the situation that Tom described in the US, I would say, um, in terms of the typology of uh, homicide, uh, this is uh, various uh, across the regions. Uh, and, um, uh, and so, for example, in Europe, uh, the predominant form of uh, uh, homicide are more toward uh, the family-related, uh, partner related uh, and some uh, interpersonal uh, uh, related. While uh, if we go and we move to the Americas, uh, you are more toward the gangs, uh, the organized crime uh, uh, type of violence. And um, if you go to, uh, for example, in Africa, we don't know much about Africa. But uh, uh, Africa is where we have uh, uh, probably a, a very high combination on all of this. So you have very high le level of violence also uh, interpersonal and, and family related. 
uh, but also you have, uh, in, again, in some spotted area, also what can be defined as uh, gangs uh, and more organized crime. So, um, again, I think uh, the message here is that uh, there is not one way of preventing uh, uh, violence, and particularly homicide violence. And first of all, we need to understand uh, what the typology, what drives it, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, if you want, because something is to prevent uh, family violence, you know, you put in place a certain uh, uh, policy, uh, certain things to protect the victims, etc. Very different uh, if you have to think about uh, preventing uh, organized crime, for example. And where the organized crime component, I'm talking about a lot of the organized crime because that's what we know a lot, we do a lot of research on. Um, the organized crime component uh, is not only an issue that uh, relates uh, to more uh, local level where you can address, for example, some of the issue of uh, uh, family violence, uh, but you need also more of a macro perspective. And, and uh, if we have the time, I'd be happy to also discuss this relationship between drug trafficking that, uh, and uh, uh, violence, uh, because uh, there is a lot of misconception around uh, these uh, uh, this links and how, you know, the their link and who, what causes uh, um, what. Um, on uh, the other thing that I think Tom said that uh, we have looked at also global level uh, is uh, how much uh, this uh, social and economic determinants um, like poverty, inequality, affect uh, homicide. And this is very important uh, because uh, we wanted to understand, uh, well, you know, the issue of violence today, we just uh, move and we work on development uh, in 30, 40 years, uh, we will uh, have, uh, uh, you know, um, reduce uh, violence. And as Thomas has said, and this is true uh, globally, you see that in some places, yes, in some countries, uh, working on development, is really, you see that the majority of the violence uh, is relating to this uh, social and economic uh, uh, factors, uh, like inequality, poverty, education particularly. Um, but... Uh, in uh, other countries don't. There are other issues uh, that, and if we don't understand those issues, uh, and I give you an example, uh, and we have done this analysis, for example, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, you see that the European countries more or less, uh, you know, the level of development uh, explain the level of homicide in Europe. Except for Eastern Europe, where you have a much higher uh, homicide level, and that is because you have a problem with alcohol. And in fact, the great, great majority of homicide uh, in Eastern Europe uh, relates to alcohol use. And that's where probably you don't have in the US much. And so, and that's something that then, uh, you know, the, 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 the things to address. You go to Central America, the level of homicide in Central America is much higher than the level of development that they have. And because the X factor there is basically the issue of organized crime and, uh, uh, and, and gangs. So there are these, I think, peculiarities that we need to understand when uh, we look uh, and we wanted to understand that there are for each um, region, country, and even at, at country level, uh, at sub, uh, uh, sub-national level. So um, given this variation, one of the things that um, the Homicide Monitor did was provide some specific examples of, of what works. So we've heard a little bit about the Oakland example in the US. Um, can you give us a little bit of, of flavor of what seems to work, again, given that there is variation in what's sort of driving violence across around the world? One thing that I also want to, I forgot to mention about the urban, the city level violence. Again, at the global level, it's interesting to see that uh, uh, there is not really a pattern where you can say uh, city violence is always higher than uh, national violence. There are actually uh, cities where cities probably bring the protective factors and city where actually city becomes uh, a, a, where these uh, uh, risk factors are actually are uh, multiplied uh, and then they become more important and, and actually there is more violence. So, and, and actually we have seen at, uh, in some regions uh, like uh, um, in Asia that uh, you see that uh, the violence in cities uh, has uh, decreased more than the national violence. And, uh, and even uh, I was mentioning the Central America, if you again, you see a map 
of where there is the highest uh, violence, most of the mo highest violence is at the border. Uh, for example, at border lines, we have border areas between Guatemala, El Salvador, and um, so uh, again, there is not this global partner that in some countries, like I think as Tom said in the US, you know, the city becomes uh, in, in, an element uh, where exacerbate this issue of violence, uh, but in some cases actually can be protective. And the protective, I'll give you an example. We did, uh, when you say what works and what doesn't work, uh, we have compared, uh, this is more of a, a long-term uh, uh, long trends. We have compared New York, Chicago, uh, and Los Angeles. Because uh, they started, uh, they had a similar pattern, if you see the homicide. And uh, as Tom said, uh, the crack cocaine level, both uh, you see that uh, um, these cities, uh, you know, went uh, up. And and then went down. But what you see is that, uh, uh, and we are, by the way, in all of this, uh, in these three cities, also with uh, gang uh, violence uh, also present. And what, what, what is interesting to see is that uh, uh, in this decreasing of homicide, at a certain point, uh, New York and Los Angeles keeps diminishing. Los Angeles and New York keeps being more and more safer, while Chicago, has not reached and has, has a, a higher level of violence than these two cities. So what do these two cities did? And one of the things that they really, I mean, there is, I mean, we can spend a, um, an evening just to talk about what they did, but one element that I want to highlight, that of course alone, as Tom was saying, often is a combination. It's not one factor that uh, helps, but one element that I want to highlight uh, is the reform in the police. And then they have translated and they have reformed the police into pol uh, community policing uh, uh, approach. And, uh, and you see, for example, that uh, the people in Los Angeles uh, trust uh, today the police uh, much, much more than what they trusted like 20 years ago. Uh, and again, and that goes back to the circle that I think Thomas was mentioning, when you trust the criminal justice system, uh, when you have a trust on the state, uh, then it's a deterrence per se on not committing uh, uh, violence. Another thing that I wanted to mention uh, is um, things that we have looked at, that they work and not work, that are like program, particularly in relation to um, gangs violence, for example, in Brazil. There is a famous uh, Fico Vivo uh, program uh, that shows uh, how, again, these elements that I think uh, Tom has brought, uh, the issue that you have to bring different constituencies. You have to bring uh, the law enforcement, uh, uh, you have to bring the social services, you have to bring um, those that say, we are here, we can help you. Um, and so, and then uh, uh, particularly establishing also the presence uh, of uh, uh, the state uh, in the favelas. And, and uh, we're, uh, and this basically what this, uh, um, uh, these programs have shown that really work whenever there is this investment uh, to bring into um, communities that are very highly affected by violence, and particularly this uh, uh, dynamics of gang violence, uh, and then they can translate the vicious cycle of violence into a virtue cycle. Um, where they stayed. The last thing what I, that I wanted to highlight that we have presented in the report, not because we have done it, uh, but because I think it's very interesting and uh, show is more of an, an historical turn. And then the, uh, Manuel Eisner of uh, Cambridge has uh, done a lot of work on looking at historical data on homicide. And, um, and what is uh, one of the interesting things is has been comparing Jamaica and Singapore. And, um, and it's interesting to see that um, until uh, probably 50 years ago, they were basically both islands, they have the same level of GDP, about the same uh, number of people. Uh, uh, both uh, have been under the uh, British uh, um, colonial system. But at a certain point, uh, something happened in Jamaica and something happened in Singapore. And then you see that in Jamaica, the homicides starting to go up and Singapore started to go down. And now they are, they cannot be more far apart. So what happened, and I think it's more interesting to understand what happened in Singapore that made it. Uh, and, uh, and one of the elements that much, many, a lot of research highlights is the role of education. And this is something that you can see in all, and we have also presented in the homicide report an analysis of how, again, education indeed uh, affect uh, globally uh, homicide, uh, but also the rule of law uh, and uh, um, combating corruption. So are this uh, um, state building uh, uh, um, that happen in countries, but then in the long run, uh, 
uh, help to uh, reduce uh, violence. Um. So I just want to pick up on that thread for a second, and then I'm, I'm going to turn it over to the audience soon. Um, one of the things that I took away that I think is very powerful from, from the recent work that you all did is that it is rule of law and it is rule of law operating within a framework that abides by human rights principles, which gets to, I think, this fairness and legitimacy point. And I, I would be interested in hearing you kind of dig into that a little bit, because I think um, a lot of the way that certainly uh, foreign assistance um, is, is thought about and, and even distributed is thinking about the strength of rule of law institutions much more heavily than thinking about the perceived fairness of um, law enforcement and institutions that uphold rule of law. So how can we do a better job of, of getting that balance right, I suppose is the question. This is always an interesting question because uh, we have to be, uh, how can I say, yeah, fair. If you see often very controlled society are less violent. Uh, and, uh, and then the question is, I think, uh, what does violence mean? And, uh, and is violence only the homicide uh, in the street, or is, uh, you know, how do you also account for the state violence? How do you account for, uh, um, which uh, uh, often they don't appear in the statistics. And uh, even if uh, in the, um, uh, what we have attempted to do in, in, uh, in the homicide studies, uh, for example, to compare the homicide by police and uh, uh, toward police. And uh, you know, you would expect that if you had that kind of fairness, uh, you would expect that more or less, uh, um, either they are about the same, or eventually you would assume well, law enforcement is one of the most at risk um, sector, and so you would expect that police may have even a higher risk of being killed than a normal uh, uh, person. But if you wanted to exaggerate, we say, well, okay, to be fair, at least they should not be far apart. Well, you see in some countries where actually the killing by police uh, is much higher. Uh, than uh, the killing to police. So clearly there you have uh, an issue. And in these cases, uh, very often, uh, they actually, the they killing by, the unjustifiable killing uh, uh, by the police uh, is often happen in countries where there is already a high level of violence. Again, and they, and they are part of this uh, vicious cycle uh, uh, that then they bring more violence. And then the more violence there is, the more police feel justified to have more violence. Um, and so, and definitely, that uh, uh, you know is, um, is something that uh, we, we need uh, we, we need to look at uh, in terms of uh, um, in terms also of uh, fairness. Uh, if you see where also there is this uh, link between uh, impunity and high level of violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in the Americas, where you have the highest level of homicide, is also the highest level where there is great impunity. And so, how much again uh, this. Uh, uh, and basically, it's translating at the macro level what I think Tom was saying at, uh, at policy, at, at, polit at program level, uh, where if you don't have uh, that uh, enforcement element in the criminal justice, uh, uh, or that uh, the punitive element, uh, uh, in a way, the, the, the good punitive element uh, that uh, um, give deterrence uh, toward committing violence, uh, then of course uh, that has been more violence. I saw you, did you want to come in on this point or? Um, well, I think that there's a, I think there's just been some, um, I, 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 I can't speak to Sing Singapore or, uh, or Jamaica, although I have spent some time in Jamaica, but I can speak to LA versus Chicago versus New York. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right about um, uh, the trends there. Uh, but I think that the story um, there is actually a, a bit more complicated um, in that um, I think both LA and New York have actually committed to this sort of set of strategies that are focused and balanced and fair. Uh, more, and it's not simply uh, just embracing reform. Uh, 
in terms of, um, you know, in LA, and there's also a sort of remarkable situation in that the, the uh, part of the, the turnarounds in both LA and New York coincided with a new police chief in both places, the same police chief, Bill Bratton, who was responsible for a major turnaround in New York and then went to Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, but I think it's important to understand that the, the turnaround is not just one of policing. Um, in New York, one of the reasons that New York is successful, and in fact, I don't really talk about New York a lot, because New York is simply so wealthy that it is not really a replicable strategy. But New York, in addition to having a very large and very sophisticated police force, um, it has a, a, a rich tapestry of alternatives to incarceration and community-based organizations that are all focused on providing viable alternatives to the criminal justice system. And that there's really no other city in the United States that really matches that, uh, that level of, uh, of alternatives. But in LA, they have uh, the gang reduction youth development uh, uh, system that was started during Bratton's time, where they're funding, you know, putting, you know, 15, 20, 25 million dollars towards uh, positive youth development uh, among the highest risk uh, youth and families. Um, and so they're invest, and I think this is a very important concept to understand about legitimacy both in the United States and globally. In, legitim in, in the United States, legitimacy is conceived of primarily, and the conversation is primarily about fairness. It's about, are poor people of color treated fairly by the criminal justice system? But in reality, legitimacy doesn't just depend on fairness. It also depends on effectiveness, meaning that it's also important for a system, in order to be deemed effect, legitimate, to be effective as well as being fair. So in the, because in the United States, and this is true, I think, for poor people all around the world, their complaint is not simply that the police are corrupt, or the police are brutal, or the police are treating us disproportionately harshly. It's also the police are not keeping us safe. And in fact, when you look at studies of legitimacy in other places, the primary reason that people don't believe in the criminal justice system in many Latin American and Caribbean countries or in African nations is because the police simply can't be depended on to keep you safe. You call the police, they don't come. They're of no use. And so this is a very important thing to understand about criminal justice, is that criminal, the criminal justice system's illegitimacy is based on being simultaneously too harsh and too weak. It's not as simple as just a, a system that is overstretched. It's a system that is, is over-delivering and under-delivering at the same time. Which I think goes to the, the point of impunity, right, right, as well. So let's open it up for questions. Um, I'm going to ask people to please introduce yourself quickly um, and pose your question in, a, in the form of a question. Um, we will take, I think, three at a time and then, and then give time to answer and we should have enough time for a couple rounds. So I see a hand back here. have another no more questions it's okay I'll, I can it's one. yeah it might be easier to uh, uh, so I think that you know one of the things that you see in countries uh, that really have uh, ex extremely high rates of violence is something that uh, we call sometimes no-go zones um, which are, you know, broad uh, areas of a city or a country where the state is, is, is essentially absent. 
um, and that's going to your issue where the state, you know, um, is not providing services or, or, or anything there. And I think that one of the fundamental issues is you have to restore the presence of the state. Um, and I think that it, it's important that that not be simply a matter of law enforcement. So for instance, in uh, Brazil, in Rio, they had this uh, pr uh, process called the UPPs, the, uh, the pacification police. And the original promise of the UPPs was that they would, uh, that they would go into these no-go zones, take them over, and provide policing, but also provide services, and also restore city services. Well, um, as happens far too often, um, the, pl the promise to keep the policing was kept, but the services never came. And ultimately, the UPPs sort of broke down over time because they didn't uh, ultimately keep that promise of balance. And so I would say there's really no sort of evidence-informed strategy to do all of this. But I think the important thing is, is you can't, you, you, can, you can provide stability in the short run simply with law enforcement. Uh, but that stability uh, has to be maintained over time with services uh, and, and, uh, and other forms of support. I think, uh, yeah, I, I would have, uh, and just to say, definitely what you're saying is, uh, is true, and uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in Colombia, where uh, uh, you may know, you know, there is uh, now an increase uh, uh, of uh, violence, particularly of presence of uh, organized uh, crime violence, uh, but also the killing of, for example, of uh, human rights defenders. And all of this happens uh, in areas that are very far from the cities, from exactly where the government uh, um, presence is. And what happened in these circumstances uh, is that uh, sometimes either the organized crime become the government of that community with all uh, the, um, you know, the issues that uh, they bring, because definitely they are not Mother Teresa, but uh, you know, they understand that working with the community improves the business. And so, but then what happens is that the community becomes kind of dependent on that protection, but also services, because they become, in a way, service provider. And the, the, the hardest thing is to break that level, because once we have established this kind of dependence, you would have the communities that they don't want to have the presence of the state, because in a way, the presence of the state may bring tension, and so they may have violence again. And so how do you also, again, in situation like this, as government, if you go only with the idea, now I conquer again, I reconquer the, the state presence, that doesn't work, because produce much higher violence, and we have examples in Mexico, Brazil, wherever. I mean, we, we know. Uh, but, that was, but how do you break that vicious? That's the hardest thing. Because it means uh, to, first of all, to have very large infrastructure, very large uh, um, in, in investment, and, uh, and often large investment come and government comes and go. And I have seen in some countries, uh, and for example, Colombia is the example, but, but, but many others, uh, you know, government have uh, uh, like a span of like four years. In four years, uh, you're not solving this kind of uh, problem. And so if you want to invest uh, largely, and then when a government uh, change, then uh, the, uh, one of the examples that historically I have seen where really a government has restored and got out of this vicious cycle is Thailand. And, uh, and you know the reason why Thailand, I'm talking about where there was the Golden Triangle and where you know, all the heroin in the, in, the, in the world used to come from there. And uh, what happened in there and what the, the fortune there of Thailand is that uh, this uh, project uh, to bring the state, uh, to, um, to you know, bring this community that were totally, uh, really, no, they didn't even feel Thai at that time, and uh, was because it was under the wings of the, the king. And then that gave continuity. That gave the exact resources. And if you go today, and you see what it was 30 years ago, you really see that, that first of all, it is possible, but it required this long-term investment and this continuity.
I, I think just another point that's interesting here, and then I know there's another question, is um, that much of the violence, much of the homicide violence that we're seeing in the world today is actually in middle-income countries. It's not actually in the poorest countries. Not that it doesn't exist there, right? But the, the, the greater concentration is in middle income. So we shouldn't also assume that there isn't a higher level of capacity, maybe not as high as we have in the US, right? But, but that's a point I think that needs to be added on. Akim, I think you had a question. Thank you very much for a great panel. Achim Winman from the Grad Institute here. Um, your title is Ending Violence to Build Urban Peace. So I, I, my first question is, do you see a fundamental difference between the strategies, policies, and approaches behind ending urban violence and building urban peace on the other side? The title seems to suggest that ending urban violence is a means to an end. So you end violence to build something bigger, which is an urban peace. So two questions with, with relation to that, sub-questions. If you did end the violence, then what? That's the one. And in your experience, what has really worked in terms of structuring longitudinal financing that goes beyond these kind of political cycles, that goes beyond programs. What are the real innovative financing strategies to make that connection between the reduction of violence and these longer strategies of building peace in the city? So, uh, I mean, the answers are not gonna be super encouraging in that I have a tentative answer for the first question and no answer for the second question. Uh, I think that I think that the argument that I make in the book is that we need to treat urban violence first. And I'm careful by what I mean by first. I don't mean um, first as a matter of priority. I mean first simply as a matter of sequence. In the book, I'm not arguing that the most important thing or the only thing to do to reduce concentrated poverty or to improve economic and social justice is reducing violence. I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is that in the timing of it, you need to do it before other things because it is so intricately linked to these broader outcomes. And it, what I have found in my experience doing urban revitalization through the Obama administration, through my own work uh, as public, head of public safety for Governor Cuomo, and if you ask any mayor in the United States, you first must get excessive and runaway rates of violence under control before you can do these broader efforts. No one should be satisfied with a uh, community, city, or nation that is uh, unequal, unjust, but safe. <laughs> no one would be happy with that. But I would argue that many people believe that if you can somehow address justice and equity, that violence will go away. I think that's a naive, uh, a naive way to appro approach it. I think in terms of what, what you hope to see in terms of concrete outcomes is that, um, that reduced violence will then basically uh, yield some form of peace dividend in tax revenues. In that, because urban violence is suppressing uh, um, all types of economic and commercial activity in these areas, you'll see increased economic activity and you'll see a significant increase in property values. One thing we see in the United States is you have a shooting or a homicide on a, value, on a, on a, on a property all the surrounding property and the surrounding blocks, property values go down the following year. And so you can reverse that. But the, the key issue is, okay, that's great. More tax revenues flowing in, more commercial activity and those things. But then ultimately you get to the harder question, which I don't have an answer for, which is who ultimately benefits from that? Because uh, you know, there's no guarantee that a city will then reinvest that, those peace dividends in those people and places. And so I think that's the harder question. I think the anti-violence efforts in many ways sort of buy you time, buy you a window uh, 
in which you can start to reverse this cycle. And, and, and what governments decide to do with that window is critical whether, whether you actually start this virtuous cycle or whether it's just a temporary stop. And so I, I hope that helps you uh, in some ways. I don't know if the question, if I can try to uh, change a little bit, should we all advocate uh, for ending violence uh, or should we, uh, urban violence, or should we advocate uh, for creating peace uh, in, in urban areas? And I would say it depends. Uh, I think uh, as uh, um, I would agree with Tom uh, that uh, you turn it down first if you are very high level. So that definitely, if it's very high level, is that uh, X factor that you don't, you are not going to change just simply by improving the condition of a city. And so you need to take it down to the level by which then from that level you can work on development uh, and if you want to work on uh, more peaceful and then to get, uh, uh, you know, to improve the situation from there. But not all cities are at that level. And I think that, uh, and so the message should not be by all means uh, first uh, winning, because I think there are certain city where, or certain urban conditions where uh, actually the majority the, of the violence is related to those conditions. Uh, and so the, the objective of working toward a peaceful, uh, a peace, uh, peaceful cities, uh, I think uh, that is the, the, the objective that uh, should uh, be the priority. But if the level of the violence at, is at the level where you can work at that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I would say it in a very, uh, very simple way, which is if you live in a very violent place, your first priority should be peace literally, the dictionary de definition of peace, nonviolence. But as that, as, that, uh, as that level of violence goes down, then you need to think about peace in a broader sense. So I know I'm not one of the commentators, I'm the moderator, but I'm just gonna butt in here a little bit because um, I have a microphone in my hand. So I think another thing that's um, important to mention about this title is it's in part a reflection that um, there are two sort of distinct communities that work on these issues. There is a community that's sort of hyper-focused on violence reduction and prevention and very often that's a sort of criminal justice oriented community. Um, and sometimes they are not necessarily thinking about broader issues of building peace. They're, they're less sort of root causes in orientation, um, even though there's an acknowledgement there, right? But the balance uh, tips into the, the kind of hyper focus on bringing violence levels down. There is then a community that's much more hyper-focused on a kind of root causes way of thinking about this. And Thomas talked a lot of, about this um, in, in his earlier comments. And I think part of what is very compelling here is that both of these communities need to be bringing their capacities to bear on the problem set and that some of the, you know, the principles of balance, for example, require that there is investment um, by both these communities and that we shouldn't be working at divides from one another. We should be working in, in sort of collaboration and concert with one another. So part of the title is let's, let's sort of get over these silos. Let's be focused on what the problem is but let's kind of break down these silos a little bit more to do that. I think also the balance and the fairness principles, um, if you do them right, will help to be building peace, right? By, by necessity, they're sort of working to shift a little bit of the structural um, uh, biases that exist within the system if you do them right. So I think, again, it's sort of how, we, how we're defining the terms and how we're thinking about collaboration. So thank you for entertaining my uh, interjection there. The question in the back. Hi, um, I'm Jit Salim. I manage the Inclusion Protection Engagement Unit at the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Cross and Societies here in Geneva. Um, so when you look at violent conflict and there's a gendered element to it, right? So it's often very masculine in terms of that. 
and often part of some of the solutions that are, are suggested is to kind of reverse that. I'd be interested to understand the gendered element of urban violence and sort of looking at whether that's something that could be addressed in that sense. And then taking on what was uh, what you were talking about in terms of the different constituents there, the role of um, local NGOs, charities, civil society um, in occupying a space to maybe channel some of that an anger and frustration whether that's, is there a role there? Um, is there something that that is there? And of course, more selfishly speaking, we have Red Cross branches in many of these parts of the world. Whether, is that a role that you've seen or you've experienced or, or, or should there be a role there? Thank you. First of all, the gender aspect of, the, of uh, violence, um, it depends what type of violence we are talking about. Um, but definitely, as everything, uh, uh, violence affects women and men differently. And um, in the context uh, of uh, what I think uh, Tom talks about, uh, calls um, urban violence, uh, exclude that component uh, of uh, intimate partner uh, family violence, uh, where actually women are mo uh, most of the victim. And, uh, and so, um, I think, indeed, as you say, and that's, I would say, the importance also of having the right evidence uh, in hand, uh, and to try to have this granularity that helps us to get uh, the, the, these things. Because if you see the, the number of homicides in the world, 80% uh, of the victims are men. And so, if we have to say, go into the principle, be focused, where we want to save most of the lives, the focus should, should really be on particularly young men. Uh, and, uh, but if we zoom into certain type of violence, uh, like family and intimate partner, clearly the majority, like 80% of the homicide by intimate partner, uh, um, the 80% of the victims of uh, intimate partner homicide are women. And so clearly, you know, if we focus uh, and we wanted to get out, to, to, you know, to focus on uh, uh, family violence, uh, clearly, you know, protecting women, etc., is a big component. And indeed, the NGO, for example, there, particularly with uh, um, shelters, uh, with having that approachable way of uh, getting women uh, um, in, is very important. And uh, and 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 that. Uh, but if we look at the other type of violence, uh, and particularly, for example, think about gang violence, uh, even if uh, increasingly there are girls, women involved also in gangs, uh, but predominantly are young boys. And are young boys that are not in school, uh, that, uh, you know, often, uh, for example, if you see now what is um, uh, happening in London or in some of the European city, there's a lot to do with uh, marginalization, with broken families and so on, and particularly those that really are more vulnerable are typically young men, boys. Uh, and so, to answer your question, the gender dimension is very important uh, and is m even more important uh, by considering the different typology of violence uh, in, in, in understanding. And definitely, the role uh, of NGOs is very important uh, when, uh, uh, you know, and the link between, particularly when there is the distrust of uh, uh, government. Uh, institutions uh, where definitely they can bring uh, um, that uh, link. Uh, that maybe the government cannot bring. So, I think that um, I would just you know reinforce you know the vast majority of victims uh, of homicide, or the significant majority of victims are are men. The overwhelming majority, 90, 95 percent of perpetrators, yes. are men. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, but I think that sometimes uh, we sort of reach for easy answers about toxic masculinity or other issues and sort of cultural or, or gender norms. When I think actually human behavior is gar uh, governed much less by culture than by sort of concrete circumstances. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, you know, in uh, Colombia, in particular Medellin, you know, when Medellin was the most violent city in the world, uh, many people from Medellin who lived there sort of speculated there's something inherently violent and, you know, we're, we're, we're passionate, we're prone to bloodlust, all of these things. There's something about us. I've heard people, Brazilians, say the same thing. Well, when the circumstances changed, people's behavior changed. 
And so this concept that people were sort of culturally predisposed to violence, I think is a, uh, a false one, and I think it can send you down a lot of sort of dangerous roads. I think, yes, violence, when it's perpetrated, is overwhelmingly perpetrated by men, but the vast majority of men do not perpetrate violence. And I think that this is why the principle of focus is so important for urban violence, but also for social deviance generally. Social deviance generally clusters uh, similarly in the same way. So for instance, if you look in the United States, I would suspect it's true in other places as well. In the United States, if you're talking about road safety, everybody speeds, everybody speeds. And everybody does minor traffic violations, you know, comes to a rolling stop, X, Y, Z. So we're all criminals in that sense. But if you're talking about truly reckless driving, people who repeatedly drive while heavily intoxicated, people who drive recklessly, wildly swinging across lanes, driving in excess of, in the United States, 100 miles an hour, those things. Those people are very rare, very few, and they really stand out. And they cause an enormous amount of the overall share of accidents. The same thing is true for polluters. A small number of polluters create a disproportionate amount of uh, pollution. Same thing is true for police misconduct. And so what I would argue is that no matter what social type, social deviance you're focused on, you should really be thinking about targeting the, the worst of the worst and address there. And I think this is a challenge for uh, NGOs generally because it's hard to do that targeting, and it's hard to work with the most deviant. I mean, in the United States, the people who need the most help to reduce, if you want to reduce shooting in the United States, you got to work with shooters, full stop. The issue there is shooters are pretty difficult people generally. You, you want to help them out, their first thing they tell you is, you know, is, you know, buzz off. You come back to them again, they tell you to buzz off again. You know, they, uh, you put them in a job program, they get into an argument with their boss, you put them into uh, drug treatment, they don't go. All of these different things. Ultimately, the return to persisting with those individuals when they turn, around, when they turn their lives around is enormous, but it is not easy to do. And the day-to-day -day is very frustrating. And so it's very hard to ask NGOs. I mean, it's just so much easier to work with those who are willing, you know? In the United States, we love, I mean, the, what we say is we love to work with like kids who are coachable. You know, this kid who doesn't have much, but oh, he's just so ready to turn his life around and X, Y, Z. And we need to help those kids, but that's not gonna make a difference on violence because that kid was never gonna end up being violent. That's the hard thing. If you wanna work on these things, you have to go right at the problem, not around the problem and hope 50 years down the road, it's gonna somehow magically be solved. And then, of course, you overlay that with the fact that some people and groups are designated as um, have, have a terrorist designation or some other legal restriction on providing assistance and support or engagement. There's a, a story just um, the other day about Nigeria um, and some new rules from USAID. So there was a question right here. Is there, are there other questions? There's one over here. Okay, so we'll take these two. We'll take um, these three. Good evening. Hi, I'm Shubhangi. I'm a first year student here at the Institute. And um, you mentioned Bill Bratton and uh, the precedent that he set for New York and Los Angeles uh, in terms of policing. So I want to ask to what extent could that be, could his broken windows theory be replicated outside of the American context? So let's, I'm going to take a couple because we're getting close. Sure. Um, hi, uh, my name is Julie Hofstetter. I work for the Center of Security Studies in Zurich. And um, my question might be a bit off topic, but I was wondering what your opinion is on um, uh, political violence that is happening in urban spaces. So, for example, um, the protests in Hong Kong, and where we saw violent uh, incidents happening between protesters and other citizens, but also between protesters and police. And I was wondering, would you consider this as urban violence at all, or at least as a threat to urban peace? And do you think that some of the strategies that you presented today and some of the key um, actors and institutions that you think um, have to be part uh, in finding solutions to urban violence, um, are they also relevant to these sort of more uh, political forms uh, of violence? 
I will facilitate, so I will not ask a question, so I will just uh, make a comment. I think that more or less... Introduce yourself, sorry. Sorry? Just introduce, introduce myself. Okay, Anna Alvazzi de Frate from the Small Arms Survey here in Geneva. Uh, actually, here in Geneva, we may have been talking about these things quite uh, quite a lot. So uh, I would just repeat a part of what Akim uh, said. So uh, the, the, the urban element for us is really a key because uh, we have been discussing and unpacking these this, uh, urban aspects. So um, I noticed that in the commentaries, uh, you, you went back uh, uh, very frequently, and especially Angela, to, to, to the, the big picture, to the, to the global picture. So I would really like to, 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 to hear from you in, the, in your conclusion what is distinctive of the, of the urban in terms of potential, in terms of solution. If you see in, in two words, what is the, the peculiarity of the, of the city in solving the problem? So uh, I'm, I'm going to answer the Bratton question. I'm going to uh, defer on the political violence question because unfortunately, I don't think my expertise or the book really applies directly. So I don't think I have a lot to say there. Um, and then I'll try to sum up with, uh, with uh, a, a concise statement um, as, as requested. So I think, you know, um, in terms of Bill Bratton, I think the important thing to understand about Bill Bratton is that he was a, uh, a comprehensive reformer, and he was not just someone who implemented broken windows policing. Um, and in fact, I think that uh, um, that may not be the most important part of his legacy in either New York City or uh, Los Angeles. Um, I think that in... Um, in New York City, he took, I think Bill Bratton really took a police department and then basically convinced a nation um, that, uh, that policing actually had something to do with crime and that crime was, that, and that if police changed the way they uh, operated, they could actually have a concrete impact on, on crime. And he demonstrated that in, uh, in, L in New York City and then demonstrated it in LA. Um, but the other thing that he did is he provide he did a lot of massive reforms in terms of improving police effectiveness in New York City, but in terms of improving police community relations in Los Angeles. Bratton came to LA after the Rampart scandal, where basically uh, the police had been caught um, uh, abusing communities in all kinds of ways after the uh, Rodney King riots and all of these things. And so he really, uh, you know, uh, um, transformed the department not just in terms of policing, but in terms of its relationship to communities. So that's a little bit about, and then other people have been uh, reformers in, in, his, in his sort of same, same line. Uh, and then I guess, uh, should I wait for the, the last thing to sum up? Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> okay. I don't know exactly what you want to do. I think it's interesting that you bring up a political violence because indeed in this big picture that we have discussed, definitely political violence is one important aspect. And to me, I mean, political violence is what you're discussing, like uh, um, if you want um, uh, violence and surge when uh, there are... Uh, um, uh, the population that wants to change uh, some institutional issues and then the state, uh, you know, fights back. Uh, but political violence is also, for example, terrorism, is also, you know, all of that type of violence uh, that is, uh, uh, in some cases, can be endogenous to the city, and some, in, in some cases uh, is really part of how uh, usually a state uh, works. And uh, definitely the solution to political violence, we are not going to discuss here the solution, but they are, uh, and I only want to go back to this issue again, but that's why we need to understand by type uh, to think about how uh, to, uh, you know, to, to see. I think what is important for political violence is that often there are elements uh, 
that uh, um, shows that uh, you know something is not uh, uh, that it may happen. And so it's important to have uh, a system by which uh, you can record, you can understand when uh, uh, this kind uh, of things happen. Uh. But also part of the political violence, uh, um, excluding those that, uh, if you want, a civil uh, unrest, etc. Typical, for example, on, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, is also again relating to the role of the police and to the role of the law enforcement, and um, and because uh, often. Uh, the different role that the law enforcement may have uh, can help uh, to reduce or to amplify that political violence, particularly when that political violence is against uh, the state. Um, and so it would, it's an interesting uh, to watch what is happening in Hong Kong uh, because uh, um, that will be... Um, uh, I wanted to make a point that maybe is linked also a bit to this, to say that this different also type of violence, and also going back, for example, to the violence against women, etc., they also tend to have uh, different dynamics uh, and uh, uh, in terms of trend. Like, for example, uh, uh, violence against women uh, doesn't change over time uh, very dramatically because uh, it's rooted uh, into something that is very much uh, into the society, the stereoty stereotypes uh, that are around the society, but they don't change overnight. Uh, and so there is not a policy that uh, can suddenly, and now next year we will have less uh, uh, homicide, for example, relating to um, violence against women. Other type of violence, uh, maybe a lot more short-term, uh, you can hope more for short-term changes. And particularly in relation to gangs and organized crime, for example, uh, uh, there are certain, uh, not that you can solve the problem of gangs and organized crime uh, there in the short term, but you can have a, a solution that in, in short term you can at least reduce uh, uh, the violence. And the same it goes for the political violence. I think uh, this is the type of violence that depending, it really very much depends on few actions. And few actions can really determine much larger or uh, you know, much smaller. So do you, do either of you want to pick up on Anna's point about what's distinctive about cities and the sort of urban en environment and then use that maybe as a, a way to... Okay, so I conclude, so I leave the last to word close. to Tom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think what is this thing to city is more on the response uh, to the, the violence, because um, there are some, uh, some elements to address violence, as we've been discussed, that are macro level. Uh, and like, for example, a policy on firearm, uh, a drug policy. I mean, it's something that uh, you know, requires uh, a much more national level policy. But there are uh, certain things that the city and, uh, can do that are more in relation to these things. Uh, I mean, um, I, I don't want to assume that indeed uh, New York or Los Angeles, etc., are what they are just for the police. I mean, there are many factors. But it's something that they could change. And, uh, and something that they could uh, uh, implement. And then uh, uh, there is a lot also about um, that the city can do in terms of uh, urban planning that can help um, uh, also uh, change violence, for example. So there are all of these things that then where you are closer to uh, the citizenship that uh, uh, the citizens that uh, you can do that at national level will be very difficult. And in general, actually, crime prevention uh, works uh, directly more at local level uh, then uh, again, to see these changes, particularly in the short term, that uh, mm -hmm. I guess I would just say that um, as more and more people move to cities, cities are more and more important. Um, urban policy is a bigger share, as you well know, of policy generally, and it's going to become more of a central issue to how people live their lives, as opposed to an issue for how some people live their lives. And I would say, in relation to urban violence, um, I believe, and this is related but not precisely the same, that urban violence, this nexus of all of these different forms of violence that I've discussed, is simultaneously the most serious form of violence, and it's causing more homicides than any other. It's also the most studied. There's the most rigorous research about it uh, than any other form of violence, by far. And not surprisingly, because it's the most studied, it's also the most solvable. There's eight to 10 uh, or maybe 12 
rigorously studied strategies that if you use them in, constant, uh, in combination with one another, can reliably produ uh, produce violence down. So in addition to being the most serious, studied, and solvable, I would also argue it's also the least appreciated. Um, and the reason is because of who it impacts. Urban violence is impacting the poorest, most disadvantaged, and most disenfranchised among us who don't have anyone to speak for them. It's, you know, nameless, faceless, poor young men the world over. And I think one of, and I think the challenge, and that's why you can have these fairly concrete solutions that are not applied at scale, is because of, unfortunately, who's impacting it. And so it's about us, it's on us to change that conversation. And I would just add and say a few words in closing um, that there are other populations who I think are... I thought I was going to get the last word. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might be able to. We'll see. Um, who are highly vulnerable, but they have um, very pretty substantial and strong, and strong advocacy groups already formed. So the Violence Against Children movement, for example, is quite established. It's quite strong. It's not... Um, uh, you know, the challenge is huge, and so it needs more energy, more resources, but it's a, there's a strong advocacy and kind of constituency movement there. Same for violence against women. In this space, that doesn't exist. So um, it's, it's this cohort of individuals who are highly vulnerable and not really fought for by anyone, right? Um, so with... This was a, a nice kind of way to, to conclude, which is this is serious, well-studied, and solvable. I want to remind us all that we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and specifically Goal 16.1, which has as a global commitment to significantly reduce all forms of violence. And within that, if we know that this is one of the, if not the most serious, um, challenges when it comes to lethal violence specifically, and we know that we have the tools uh, and much of the evidence to solve it, there's an imperative, right, in front of us to do more, to do better, um, to achieve this objective of significantly reducing all forms of violence. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention just in closing a campaign that my organization, Impact Peace, is co-facilitating together with Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just, and Inclusive Societies at New York University, which um, was the organizer of this event, and we should thank them. And Boyan, who's sitting right there specifically, should get uh, a round of applause when we wrap up for organizing this event. Um, and the third facilitator of this campaign is the Plus Peace Coalition, which represents roughly 20 of the largest peace-building organizations in the world including several that are based in Geneva. Um, and this campaign is really trying to bring attention and raise awareness to how serious of a challenge uh, urban violence is and to the fact that we have many of the tools. So let's, let's get serious. Let's take these tools. Let's start applying them. Let's um, push ourselves to really take a, take a big step forward in, in reducing this violence that we see. So with that, I want to thank both of our panelists. You are both wonderful, so a round of applause. And I do also want to thank Boyan, who is sitting back there. Just put your hand up. Thanks to Boyan for getting this organized and getting the word out about this. And I'm sure that we will uh, be up here for the next few minutes if anyone has questions you were too shy to ask in the group feel free to come on up. And thanks everyone for joining the discussion. Good night.